Hello and welcome back to this damnful idealistic crusade. I wanted to put together another little video like I did last year to discuss some of the titles and films that are going to be at this year's 2023 Turner Classic Movies Classic Film Festival in Los Angeles. And as with my video last year, as with any sort of film festival where you're getting a mixture of DCPs and prints, the fun, even if you can't go because it is quite expensive for tickets and you you know if, if you're like me you're not even on the same side of the country so you'd have to worry about airfare and and all the other uh, fun bits of trying to add up how much it would actually cost you to go uh, the the real fun is then in looking at the schedule and trying to determine what this means for the classic film van in the next year or so because a lot of these uh, titles are premiering restorations or uh, or have new masters available and that will most likely be turning up on physical media releases in the next year and some of these are already confirmed so usually the the, the uh, TCM film festival is a place where they will premiere new restorations and 4k restorations for example and then within the next year they're out on blu-ray or 4k uhd it's also a good way to look at uh, what prints are sort of floating around in terms of what could show up at your local uh, art house theater or repertory theater program in terms of what is actually in circulation so uh, there are a number of really interesting prints here that you don't see turn up very often and some really rare prints that I've never really seen turn up at, at a theater, so it's possible now that uh, some of these could be booked for your, your local theater depending on their, you know, their, their connections and uh, how, how good their relations are with, uh, with working with the uh, Warner Brothers repertory division and in terms of getting prints shipped to them and, and for, uh, for screenings. But it's always a good idea to, to look at the festival list and you know try and look at what's what's the new material, but also uh, look at what could be coming to physical media in the next year and what also could potentially be coming to an art house or repertory theater near you because there are some prints that are being circulated or loaned out. So as I did last year, I wrote out a brief list and I've got it broken up into a couple categories. So to start uh, with the couple that are... Uh, specifically listed as new DCPs or brand new restorations and some of these for 4K uh, with some of these already being confirmed or already coming out as 4K UHD releases. And it should be noted, of course, that this year's focus is the 100th anniversary of Warner Brothers as a studio. So there are, a, there's all, as always, because Warner is, you know, part of the same family as TCM and most of the TCM uh, airings are made up of Warner Library titles, obviously. Uh, there's always a good Warner presence, but here this year the focus is on Warner Brothers titles, and they have gone in and dug out some really core titles, key titles, and some real deep cuts, if I'm honest. So that's that's really the most interesting part for me. Uh, but in terms of the new 4K DCPs or new restorations that are going to be playing this year that I thought were notable, there's the new restoration of The Batwoman, uh, the new restoration of Cool Hand Luke, along with uh, East of Eden and Enter the Dragon. All three of those are confirmed for 4K UHD. Cool Hand Luke is already coming out. Uh, there's already some reviews for the for the new 4K Master on the UHD out already. Uh, East of Eden is on the way, as is Enter the Dragon. And Enter the Dragon is actually kind of interesting because Warner MPI did a new 2K scan for Criterion's box set of the theatrical cut. So I'm very curious to see how a new 4K Master Master might improve on the already lovely looking 2K scan they did, uh, which was already miles ahead of their old master, which was really getting long in the tooth. So this is great news for really core, important, big, notable Warner catalog titles. And again, you're able to see them premiere here at the TCM Film Festival, seeing the new 4K Master on the big screen. And then really interestingly, Sony is premiering a, a, a new restoration. It's the world premiere of their restoration of Man's Castle, which is a Frank Borzage or Borzaghi, or I never know how you're supposed to pronounce it, but uh, that's that's a really major thing because as as most film fans would be aware, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot done on uh, Borzaghi films since uh, really the the wonderful uh, Murnau, Borzaghi, and, and uh, Fox box set from the end of the DVD era. And uh, there, there's been some, some of his films have been handled and, and some, depending on what studio owns them. But that was really the last big major 
push uh, for for uh, for doing a major restoration outside of one or two from like Warner Archive, for example. So any any uh, Borzaghi title that that's done, particularly in a restoration, is really interesting and should be a real knockout. And of course, that means it's likely to come hopefully to uh, Blu-ray or UHD pretty soon for one of the boutique labels. Uh, I, I'm thinking maybe an indicator release since they have a good relationship with Sony doing a UK release or uh, I'm not sure who might do it here or Sony might release it themselves but that would be a beautiful potential release. Interestingly they also list The Music Man as a brand new DCP uh, made by Photochem with the uh, premier film lab so that that should be interesting. I, I, I don't suppose that means it's a new master, but uh, that's that's a title that you know that they haven't done any additional work to in terms of any modern uh, work or a new scan. So that should at least be an improvement over the uh, pre-existing materials. And then lastly is the 4K premiere of the restoration of Rio Bravo, which is really exciting because Rio Bravo has been a problem title for quite a while. The last go round with their attempts at a restoration in terms. of of what they did in the HD master. It did have a lot of color problems and the audio was finally upgraded to a lossless mono track on the second Blu-ray, which was basically otherwise the same as the original Blu-ray with the color problems, but uh, it was the same mono anyway. So it's, it still needs additional work and it'll be really exciting to see what this 4K master looks like because that's one of those titles where if, if I watch it, I usually wind up just going for the old DVD, even though that's really getting on up there in years because it doesn't have the, the color problems. They really, on that HD Master, they really seem to want to push everything to have that real uh, bursting color effect, and it just never seemed appropriate. Uh, it, it, particularly in the browns and the reds, seemed very much overbearing. And you know, I've not seen an IB Tech die transfer print of Rio Bravo as much as I would love to, but you know, even I, you know, would would think, you know, I'm pretty sure it probably didn't look like that. So uh, that's that's the. The 4K uh, restoration that I'm most looking forward to seeing what that looks like, and that of course will be coming to 4K UHD later in the year. Now, uh, I did want to mention one thing very briefly. If there was a a negative aspect, or or the thing you should probably avoid if you're going to the festival, or something that I would highlight as being just plain bad, uh, there is a presentation that's being given. Uh, on the subject of film preservation, but unfortunately it is from Paramount, who is pretty notorious in the home video realm for really cranking out some of the worst masters and so-called restorations in recent memory. And so the head of the division, uh, the, of the catalog division at Paramount, who seems to be the person responsible for all this stuff, is going to be giving a presentation on film preservation and, and restoration and all this stuff. And if I was there, I'd be gritting my teeth the whole time thinking about all the terrible work they've done to otherwise beautiful new scans and thus ruined the whole point of restoration. And they're certainly not preserving things. Uh, and if that wasn't enough, it's going to be accompanied by a screening of a DCP of one of their so-called restorations, which is the really really foobard master of uh, When Worlds Collide, the George Powell 1950s science fiction classic that uh, is one of those that uh, has inspired a lot of films. And in fact, you could basically say it's the thinking man's Armageddon decades beforehand. Uh, and you'd be pretty much spot on. Um, but it's one of those that unfortunately not a lot of people today have seen as much and it has not had a, a new master really until now, which Paramount only released on Blu-ray as sort of a uh, an extra to their flawed 4K release of the George Powell War of the Worlds, which itself has issues from it being handled by Paramount. But uh, this master of When Worlds Collide seems to have color issues in terms of the timing. It doesn't look look very good and it's just not a, a pleasant blu-ray disc to actually watch in fact it's so poor that the old master uh, you know bumped up to hd years ago with color fringing problems and noise and all kinds of old things which is still based on the same elements used for the old laser disc and dvd is actually kind of a more pleasant viewing experience than their so-called restored master so i think that's a, a nice case in point to show just that um these people may say nice things, but uh, they're they're not actually doing what what they're claiming, and in fact, they're 
doing a lot of damage in a lot of areas. And the fact that uh, the the screening that's accompanying this talk is a screening of their new When Worlds Collide Master, I think, really speaks volumes. So um, this would be the one thing I would I would avoid or or uh, say is a bad element of of the festival because this is this is not a a group or or company that's doing the work they claim to do. Now we get to the really good stuff, which is what prints are going to be showing up at the TCM Film Festival. And again, since the focus is Warner Brothers, they've not just gone for some really big Warner titles and some really big titles held under the Warner umbrella, including MGM, of course, but they've gone for some interesting deep cuts. And they've also gotten a, a couple of really rare prints uh, from different archives and things. So they've got about 20 or so uh, 35 millimeter prints uh, as part of the festival in addition to DCPs and 4K DCPs. So I, I figured I would just sort of run through these really quickly to give you an idea of what you'd be looking at if you were going to the festival. And again, this is even a great idea to look at what's showing up here because there is a chance that if you live near a rep theater or a uh, or an art house that does do uh, a, a really good uh, repertory film program and does have the ability to show prints properly and has good relations with the different studios, you know, it's possible they could actually book some of this because, you know, if it shows up at this festival, that means it's actually available to be publicly screened. And it's a rare thing nowadays to get any good print uh, experience. And it, it's something that should be treasured. And there are times where you really haven't seen a film until you've seen a print of it. So it can live and breathe going through the shutter at 24 frames per second. And sometimes it adds to the experience. Even if you know the film back to front, you've seen it a thousand times. If you see a print of it, uh, whether it's an original print, a reissue, a preservation print, or, you know, especially the fun stuff like a die transfer uh, Technicolor Ambition print, which is, you know, when they were done right, is like a work of art in and of itself. Or, uh, of course, they wouldn't do it here, but if you went to one of the nitrate film festivals and saw a nitrate print projected, which I still hope to do someday, uh, those are like nothing else in the world. So uh, to run through these briefly, just in alphabetical order, they've got a print of the Howard Hawks masterpiece written by Bracken and Wilder, Ball of Fire, which should be a really wonderful experience. That That's still a film that practically cries out for a Blu-ray release, but, you know, the DVD is pretty solid, but, you know, seeing a print of Ball of Fire would be amazing. Uh, then they've also got uh, Blood on the Moon from a print, and this print was actually sent from the British Film Institute, so this is one I've never seen listed anywhere being shown from a print really all that much, and it's it's something you, you don't often get the chance to see in a theater. It is more of a niche Western title, but uh, noir fans and real Western buffs, and of course Mitchum fans, are going to know this film for being such a really interesting and intricate psychological Western made by Robert Wise starring Robert Mitchum. It's a brilliant film. If you love westerns and you love noir, especially if you love both and you're a Mitchum fan, this is a must. And uh, it, it finally did get a Blu-ray release from the Warner Archive from a beautiful new scan. Uh, I've also got the old Laserdisc with the exclusive commentary, but I would love to see a print of this on the big screen. So that's, that's a real must. Um, they've also got a print of the MGM uh, iconic classic Boys Town, which should be really beautiful to see a a print of. Uh, for Liz Taylor fans, they've got a print of Butterfield 8. Uh, then really interestingly, this is one of the real deep cuts. Uh, they have a 35 millimeter preservation print because that's really all that exists of the Rin Tin Tin film Clash of the Wolves. And this is perfect for the festival focusing on the 100 years of Warner Brothers because without Rin Tin Tin, the dog, you wouldn't have Warner Brothers. They would have gone out of business because uh, ba back in the 20s especially, the Rin Tin Tin films became so ridiculously successful and turned into a whole series that uh, it basically kept the studio afloat. So any celebration of the history of Warner Brothers would have to focus quite a bit of time on Rin Tin Tin himself. 
And uh, this is just a beautiful inclusion. I've never seen a Rin Tin Tin film in a theater. I've just seen, you know, them pop up on TCM and some of the various releases. I haven't seen all of them, of course. But uh, and this one, I, I think if you read up on it, I think the the actual loan print was discovered. I think it was in South Africa. So I, I'm guessing it's this uh, South African print that was discovered. And then I think it was also added to the National Film Registry. So it's in the Library of Congress. So this is one of those that, you know, it's quite possible that it would have been lost or only available in really inferior elements. So this is a real standout and, of course, extraordinarily important for the history of Warner Brothers. The rest of the program is filled with other really interesting Warner deep cuts and a mixture of other prints. So we have The Crimson Canary, Crossing Delancey, Genevieve, uh, then we have a film that everyone should see in the theater in their lifetime at least one time, which, of course, is Kurosawa's Ikiru, which, of course, will absolutely obliterate the audience who, and you yourself included, will be just uncontrollably weeping at what may be Kurosawa's best film, which is really saying something. And it's a different experience watching it in a theater full of people as opposed to watching it at home where you're also bawling your eyes out. Uh, I have seen this as a print and oh, it, it just, it, it, it moves and it breathes with such a vitality that it is so much more impactful than seeing it at home. So this is one of the the standouts, and this does occasionally pop up at uh, art houses when they get to do Kurosawa programs. They And of course, I don't think there is uh, not yet a 4K DCP available, and you really should see prints of Kurosawa films whenever you have the chance because it's becoming a, a rare opportunity. Uh, Toho is working on a new set of Kurosawa 4K Masters, of which Ikira will be one of them. It remains to be seen how well those turn out, but uh, for the time being, this is still the best way you can see one of the most emotionally moving films ever made. They've also got the really interesting uh, bi period biopic of the Jackie Robinson story, which long before the film 42 was made, uh, actually did tread some of that same ground. Uh, I've never actually gotten to see it, but I'm, I would be very interested to see it as a print. Uh, then no celebration or discussion of Warner Brothers could not go without mentioning the I most iconic iconic single type of film in the entire Warner Brothers library, which of course is the gangster film. You cannot say Warner Brothers without gangster films. So in a nicer sort of deeper cut, they've got a print of Larceny Inc., which of course was here in the fourth volume of the Warner Gangsters collection. So this gives uh, Eddie G. Robinson fans some nice representation, and it's very rare and uncommon for anything in the Warner Gangsters ovier, if you will, the sort of uh, long spread of Warner Gangsters films to actually show up for print screenings. It's it's very rarely done, and unfortunately, uh, most rep theaters never do a Warner Gangsters program, although I would think, and I would certainly hope, that it would sell tickets like Gangbusters. I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Uh, but uh, that just seemed like a wonderful inclusion. Uh, then we also have Mr. Cohen Takes a Walk. Uh, then they've also got a print of the classic No Man of Her Own with Carol Lombard and Clark Gable based on, well, I can't say say based on because it's so loosely based on it. It doesn't even resemble it. But it was based on uh, or, or taken from, inspired by uh, the novel written by Val Luton when he was uh, writing novels and pulp stories, no bed of her own. But, of course, it's essential for Gable and Lombard fans. Uh, then we have, for Betty Davis fans, a print of The Old Maid. They've also got a print of the fascinating Paris Blues, uh, played as it lays. Uh, then for a more modern inclusion, they've got a print of Six Degrees of Separation, which I don't think I've ever seen done at a, at a rep theater, so that would be interesting to see a 90s film in included because you know seeing a print of a 90s film even if you haven't seen it in a long time is really something because we don't have that kind of quality presentation anymore in theaters uh then they've got a print of stand and deliver a print of strike up the band for musicals fans a print of unfinished business and the wiser sex so that is the 35 millimeter program of film prints included in the festival so it's a nice sort of eclectic mix with a great focus on warner titles of course but also some really nice interesting deep cuts and some prints of films you don't see pop up from other studios all that often so it's a, a really interesting mix and i think all of them would be definitely worth someone's time the real standouts, though, are the two 70 millimeter presentations, which are 
a very hard thing to be able to see in this day and age in 2023. So any sort of 70 millimeter screening is reason to celebrate. Uh, they are showing a print of Airport, which uh, I don't think most people realize was actually shot and released in a large format originally for the premiere engagements. And uh, it, it is really an interesting film to see on the big screen. I think think this is a newer print perhaps uh, I, I think i read something about uh that airport did have uh or universal made or struck new 70 millimeter prints and i think i've seen this pop up at one or two different festivals as a 70 millimeter showing but again any screening of a 70 millimeter film because it's such a rare thing and there's so few theaters left in the world who can do it and do it properly is you know, worth every bit of time and money. So uh, the, these these are these should be you know the the things I think people really put some extra focus into if you're trying to plan out what uh, what uh, what your schedule is, what films you'd like to make it to. But without question, the number one biggest draw, the the real heavy hitter, the thing that everyone should try to make it to, and the single thing that makes me want to buy a plane ticket and spend eight hundred and fifty dollars for. A, for a festival ticket and, and book a hotel and drop all kinds of money uh, is a 70 millimeter print of the legendary iconic masterwork, The Wild Bunch, uh, which is a rare film, unfortunately, to see on the big screen. It very rarely gets shown. Uh, I've finally been able to see it in 35 millimeter. And so this 70 millimeter print, like the 35 print I saw, would be from the mid 90s. Uh, they called it a restoration. Uh, there was some restoration involved, but essentially what it did was replace the 10 minutes removed for the American release of really crucial uh, quiet moments and character scenes that were cut primarily for uh, for the runtime. And uh, it was shown in 70 millimeter, uh, not, I don't think for very long. The, the engagements were also more in Europe, which also did show the film with an optional intermission. So this is a film that did have a 70 millimeter blow up with six track magnetic stereo, but it also did have an intermission on certain parts of the European engagements. Now, the mid 90s prints are, as far as I know, the best versions you can see of this film. And the 35 millimeter print I saw of the 90s uh, reconstruction is the best I've ever seen the film. But because it was a reconstruction and not a full-blown restoration and nothing has been really done since that we know of, it's not perfect. And, you know, it was done, you know, with photochemical tools of the time for a very limited theatrical reissue. And then it was, you know, transferred for home video on Laserdisc, VHS, and then the first DVD in the mid to late 90s. So um, it does actually look quite similar to to how those releases looked o overall with, with format limitations, of course, obviously. Obviously. But this is even more important because the film's current home video status is absolutely dire. Uh, the film was remastered and rescanned for the special edition DVD, which did have some color issues and is really uh, getting on up there in years. Uh, it wasn't, it, it was, you know, it, it was at least a slight improvement, but it wasn't that great. And then we got the early HD DVD and Blu-ray port of that, which did fix some of the color problems, but has a lot of uh, digital noise reduction. And it's a very, uh, very poor encoding because it's an early disc and the Blu-ray is really a port of the HD DVD, like most early Warner discs. So it does not uh, maximize the full potential of a dual layered Blu-ray disc. And we're still stuck with that same Blu-ray from like, you know, 2007, 2008 era based on an HD DVD on code, originally based on a master done for a DVD. It's ridiculous that Warner has never revisited the film. It is rumored that they are working on a 4K restoration and release, and it's further rumored that, of course, it would be tied into the Please God, don't let them do it. Remake of the film. Uh, so if that does come to pass, that would probably happen in the next couple of years that we would finally see an upgrade to the Wild Bunch, which is one of the most glaring titles in need of a of a total upgrade and overhaul in the entire Warner Library on home video because that Blu-ray is absolutely terrible and that's unfortunately kind of the best you've got and I also do have some quibbles with the 5.1 up mix and you know I, I wish somebody would do the audio from scratch and retain the film's original mono from the 35 millimeter release and, and have the option of seeing the European uh, intermission card branched in so there's there's a lot of potential there but the chance of seeing the film on 
on the big screen from a film print is already very limited. It rarely pops up. But to see it on a 70 millimeter print in the best possible way to see the film and to see it and feel it as truly intended uh, is absolutely worth the entire cost of admission. It is without question the single biggest draw of the TCM Film Festival. And again, it's the one thing that makes me want to <laughs> just drop, you know, like uh, probably over a thousand dollars right now to pay for airfare and a hotel and the ticket and. Yeah, I have to fight the urge. Uh, it's 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 that uh, big of an opportunity because, again, it's hard to even see a 35 millimeter print of the Wild Bunch, let alone being able to see a 70 millimeter print. So, to anyone who is going to the festival, please, whatever you do, don't miss the 70 millimeter print presentation of one of the greatest westerns and one of the greatest American films ever made. Sam Peck and Paws, The Wild Bunch. So those have been my thoughts on the lineup for the 2023 TCM Film Festival, which runs later this month in April. Uh, of course, you can visit their website and look at the schedule for yourself. And if you're in the area, you're probably already trying to see what you might be able to make it to. And they do sell individual tickets in addition to passes, but uh, the individual tickets are you know a lot harder to get because I think you have to get them like the day of showtime just before and it's sort of first come first serve. Uh, but if you're in the area or going, these are, I just think, some interesting highlights and also great for film fans to look at and try to see what might be possible to see uh, coming out on physical media in the next couple of years or next couple of months. And again, some are already confirmed, some are already coming out, uh, but also to look and see what's available as as prints to be loaned. And so uh, these these might be titles that you could potentially see pop up at a local uh, art house or repertory theater, uh, or uh, if if your uh, your theater or art house uh, has uh, audience feedback titles, you might be able to request because there are, there are prints that are being loaned out uh, for the festival. So I always think it's interesting to look at it from both both a home video physical media perspective and a film print geek perspective <laughs> because you, you can then think maybe oh man maybe I might get the chance to see that if it gets you know shown somewhere else or 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 sent to a to a theater near me or something um, but anyway I, I just like I like looking at festival lists like this anyway uh, because you do have to kind of read between the lines trying to figure out when things might actually happen in terms of a new master, new release, restoration, so on and so forth. And you have to just gleam information wherever you can. So uh, this is this is sort of how my brain works when I read the TCM Classic Film Festival schedule lineup list. So uh, I hope this has been at least somewhat fun and informative. Uh, and as always, thank you ever so much for watching.